Well, as you all know, this is what upstate New York looks like all year. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I'm very pleased to be here. Uh, I actually emailed a friend yesterday who asked me how the meeting was going, and I said, it's great being around all these really smart people. And it has been really great being around all these smart people here. Uh, as uh, Ron mentioned, I'm at Cornell. And uh, we also have a center that we started recently called the Center for Enervating Neuroimmune Disease. And that uh, is a name that a patient actually came up with for the disease rather than the horrible name chronic fatigue syndrome. Uh, so we like calling it enervating neuroimmune disease. Uh, if you want more information about our center, that's, the website uh, is there and you can have a look. Before I start talking about the work today, I'd like to acknowledge the researchers who uh, are, have been working with me. The four people uh, on the left are in my laboratory, uh, and uh, two people on the top are postdoctoral associates. I have a graduate student, a Alexandra, and a long-term technician. I've been collaborating with a well-known MECFS physician, Susan Levine. We have an excellent statistician, and uh, metabolomics uh, uh, expert, Jason Locasel. Before I talk about metabolomics, which is the, the topic of my uh, talk, I want to mention this paper that many of you know about that was published last year, and it was a collaboration with Ruth Lay's group uh, at Cornell, uh, in which we uh, documented that the gut microbiome differs between people with MECFS and uh, healthy individuals. And this has also been replicated by several groups now, that there's something wrong with the gut microbiome, including Chris Armstrong's group and others. But after publishing this paper, a number of patients have emailed me and said, what can I do? To, uh, should I have a fecal transplant is one of the questions that I'm often asked. And I had to say, I don't know, because we don't have enough studies. So I'm pleased to mention that uh, the Norwegian government has uh, now funded a study to actually find out if, if a fecal uh, transplant would be helpful in chronic fatigue syndrome. And this is being led by P Peter Holger Jonsson, a group up in very northern Norway, as you can see on that map. And that study will be starting later this year. Now we are actually collaborating with his uh, study and what we are doing is, uh, uh, is, is uh, the type of study shown on this slide. So in our er earlier paper, we showed that LPS-related proteins were elevated in the MECFS cases. Now, LPS is a lipopolysaccharide. It's on the outside of bacteria. And when the bacteria get into your bloodstream through a leaky gut, the LPS is detected by some proteins in, uh, and it unfortunately is detected as if you're being infected by something and it causes inflammation. So we showed in this earlier study that the uh, lipopolysaccharide binding protein is higher in patients than in controls and also another protein called uh, soluble CD14 uh, that's also part of the detection system in the body is also higher. Each one of those dots represents the level found in either a patient or a control. So what we're doing with uh, Peter's group is we will be actually measuring the amount of LBP and uh, CD14 before and after the fecal transplant to see if this uh, normalizes and uh, uh, indicating reduction in the leaky gut problem uh, in patients. Now, uh, the actual sequencing and characterization of the bacteria is going to be done in Norway. Uh, but we will t take on this uh, small aspect of the project. Okay, so now I'd like to switch to talking about uh, metabolism. And this is a paper that uh, was published uh, earlier this year uh, in which we examined a, a small group of uh, patients and controls uh, using samples that had been supported uh, for the collection of those samples had been supported by NIH, but it was actually Cornell that supported the uh, metabolite analysis as we didn't have NIH funding for the uh, metabolism studies. And what we found was uh, that there were three primary pathways that were affected 
uh, in patients versus controls, fat metabolism, energy and sugar metabolism, and amino acid and purine metabolism. We found there were 33 metabolites that uh, were significantly different in their amounts. We now have a new study, uh, and using again samples that were uh, collected through NIH funding for a previous study, not for this study, where we're using some samples with the permission of the uh, participants. Uh, all of our subjects that we're analyzing are female. Their um, median age is about the same, and their median bo body mass index is about the same. We also uh, had their SF36 scores. I'm sure many of you in the audience have filled out those SF36 forms. And if you, um, this is one way to represent the data in which uh, the higher the score, the further on the outside of that circle you are, the healthier you are. You can see here that uh, with regard to mental health, the patients are surprisingly uh, similar to healthy individuals given their terrible challenges of this illness. But uh, with regard to their physical condition, their, their scores are quite low as they're uh, quite impaired. So this was our patient population that we analyzed. This time we uh, analyzed uh, uh, these uh, samples uh, using the technology of Metabolon, which is a company that provides meta metabolite analysis. And this study was entirely supported. The Metabolon study was supported by the Solve MECFS initiative. And so I must thank them for providing the funds to be able to do this. Uh, Metabolon gives you the data on 832 metabolites in plasma. Uh, in, and these belong to eight super pathways that are uh, in, involved in uh, metabolism. What we found was that in both our uh, earlier study and in the new study, we have some disturbances in fat and lipid metabolism. So on the left, I've listed a number of the um, metabol metabolism pathways that were detected in the earlier study. And uh, we're seeing also some disturbances in, in uh, uh, fat and lipid metabolism. So I'm going to be showing a number of graphs like this on the right in which uh, the uh, healthy individuals are shown uh, pink with health here, or you're blue with MECFS. And uh, you can see that the uh, average level of that me metabolite on the right is uh, much lower, although there's quite a range uh, between the uh, different individuals who are healthy or have MECFS. Now, something else that we observed is that the plasma glucose was lower in, uh, in the uh, patients in, in both studies, in both the uh, uh, earlier study uh, that was uh, published as well as uh, this new Metabolon data. And um, uh, we're trying to come up with some reasons for this and also come up with an idea of what this might mean with regard to uh, disrupted, disrupted or abnormal metabolism in MECFS. So in thinking about this, we uh, consulted a, uh, a study that was done uh, of athletes. And uh, these athletes uh, had a, did a 50-mile bike ride. And then various, uh, various uh, metabolites and other molecules were measured. And what was found is that the individuals who had the higher serum glucose or fructose had a higher performance, uh, and they had lower cortisol, and they also had lower inflammation. And so they had enhanced recovery. So what about, uh, what might this be? This is just a, a hypothesis. What might this be related to with regard to MECFS? Uh, this would mean that lower blo blood glucose would predict reduced recovery. So instead of having enhanced recovery with high serum glucose, we can reverse the arrows. And every arrow uh, would be reversed. You would expect uh, with lower serum glucose, higher cortisol, higher inflammation, and reduced recovery. So what do we actually see when we analyze these patients? So the trip to the doctor's office. 
I would bet that a lot of you who are here, just the trip to come here feels like a 50-mile bike ride. Am I right? Yeah. So, um, so uh, MECFS people do some exertion. Uh, their serum glucose then is lower. Their cortisol is higher. Their inflammation is higher, and their recovery is reduced. So uh, what is the actual measurement when we do this uh, measurement in the, in the blood of somebody who's been to the doctor's office? We indeed find that their glucose is lower and their fructose is lower, their cortisol is higher, and their inflammation, as you know, uh, people have been repeatedly found to have uh, higher cytokines now, it resulting in potentially reduced recovery. So I'd like now to switch to a different type of metabolism. And this is the metabolism of immune cells. This is not the metabolism of your whole body, but the immune cells in your body. And we've also heard a lot of uh, studies in the past indicating there's something wrong with the immune system. What's ha what we, we still don't understand that, but I think it's a very exciting area uh, of research. So I'm going to only talk about one type of immune cell today. This is the T cell. Uh, it's a very important type of uh, white blood cell. Uh, different types of T cells have different functions, but they are really critically important. They induce immune responses. They produce cytokines. They regulate immune responses. And then they uh, destroy, some types of them actually destroy cells that have been infected with some pathogen. And for T cells to work properly, they have to upregulate their metabolism. So a quiescent T cell is doing some glycolysis. It's doing some oxidative phosphorylation in the mitochondria. But a responding T cell has to upregulate both of these. So we wanted to find out if there's anything uh, that's abnormal in MECFS T cells. And the, the technology we're using for this is uh, something that you may have heard about. It's the, the Agilent Seahorse Flux anal Analyzer. Uh, this uh, device um, uh, allows you to measure both glycolysis and oxidative phosphorylation. With regard to glycolysis, uh, it allows you to measure the protons that are produced during glycolysis. And with regard to oxidative uh, phosphorylation, uh, it actually uh, lets you look at oxygen consumption. So th the way this uh, works is you put some cells in a little dish there. And then the uh, device automatically sticks some probes into the dish. And it can then measure. Uh, either your uh, either the protons or the oxygen amount in the, in the dish, and you can also inject various inhibitors that allow you to look at the various stages of uh, either glycolysis or oxidative phosphorylation. So again, we have done a study now, and uh, this study actually has been supported by NIH. We're pleased to say, and the uh, T cells. Uh, were isolated from 20 uh, female MECFS patients and 20 healthy controls. Again, the mean age was very similar, and the me mean body mass index was very similar. And again, our patients are significantly impaired in comparison to the controls with regard to their physical condition, but not with regard to their mental health. Uh, What we found was that there was no significant difference in glycolysis in total T cells in the patients versus the controls. One thing I need to explain is that these cells were supplied with glucose, which is the fuel for glycolysis. So what's happening in your body can be different than what's happening in this in vitro system. But at least it shows that there doesn't seem to be an inability of these T cells to utilize glucose and carry out glycolysis. In contrast, we found that the T cells from the MECFS patients are using significantly less of their respiratory capacity. So if you look at the graph on the left, again, that shows the range of the values for the patients and the controls. But you can see that the average is quite uh, low in the, uh, in the uh, patients uh, versus the controls. And we don't understand why this is, why 
the cells are using less of their respiratory capacity. And this is something that we need to try to figure out. Uh, and, but it is a clue that there's something going on uh, with regard to mitochondrial metabolism that uh, is, is abnormal, along with all the data about the metabolite analysis. So I'd, I'd just like to end with uh, something that uh, we are planning to do. We're seeking funds for this uh, project right now. Uh, I personally am very interested in the phenomenon of post-exertional malaise because I think that's one of the most disabling symptoms of this disease because if you try to do anything, you then have a relapse and get worse. So I, I have always been interested in trying to understand this phenomenon because I feel that by understanding this, we may understand a lot about the disease. We, uh, we also, it also gives us an opportunity to examine uh, individuals when they are bad and when they are worse. And if we can find out what makes them worse, maybe we can find out make, what makes you bad in the first place. So uh, we are interested in collecting blood samples before and after exercise. And then we would like to do mass spectrometry to measure metabolites. We'd like to be analyzing the glycolysis and uh, oxidative phosphorylation and uh, try to figure out what is this phenomenon, post-exertional malaise. And then hopefully we can understand why you're converted from a healthy person to someone with ME-CFS. And then maybe we can figure out how to get you back to that healthy state. Thank you.